gives you something to take away with today. And especially if you'd like to join us in our little report out family. So, okay. So at this point, I just want to state that if you would like to um, tag us in on Twitter, please do. Um, you can find us at out underscore report. Um, if you'd like to do that, if you'd like to tweet me, then by all means do. You're entirely more than welcome as well. Um, that's absolutely no problem in the slightest. Um, I am the chair of Report Out and the founder of the organisation. And it's exciting times for Report Out as we start our new events and we get used to being public and outward facing. And we've hosted some fantastic events so far. If you've been to them uh, so far, they're brilliant. Uh, we'll be sending you a feedback link at the end of this via Eventbrite and would love you to complete the survey as well. That would be brilliant. So let's get started. So men with the pink triangle. Um, before we get there, we need to have a discussion about what we mean by genocide. Um, and so I'm going to kind of start off this talk about what is genocide? How does genocide work? Um, are we seeing genocide in the world around us currently? And what types of genocides have perhaps happened in the past, um, which is key to the discussion about the men in the pink triangle? Um, after World War II, uh, in 1949, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was passed by the United Nations, with a public which was hugely supportive of this after some of the Nazi horrors um, that we saw happen throughout parts of Europe. Um, this established at the time genocide as an international crime or crime against humanity, uh, against humanity um, where signatory nations undertake to prevent and punish. And genocide means that you have an, a, an intended um, commit, commitment to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. And it defines us down further as either through killing members of that group or through causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions whereby um, their life will be physically destroyed either in whole or in part. So, for example, working people to death. It's also about imposing um, intended prevented births on people. So sterilization of groups of people could be another form of genocide as well. It could be argued so. So it could forcibly transferring children from one group to the other, which we saw happen in uh, Australia where the British give Aboriginal children to white parents. So there's different forms of genocide which have happened over time. And genocide is nothing new. This goes back to South and Central America with perhaps one of the largest and most undocumented genocides we've ever seen, um, where we saw the, the destruction of indigenous people who lived there before the Spanish conquistadors um, got there and were then destroyed afterwards through acts of rape, violence, um, and sexual disease and disease. So Taking that forward and understanding that definition of genocide, um, the term came originally from a Polish Jewish lawyer called Raphael Lampkin, um, who sought at that point to um, kind of describe the Nazi policies of the systematic murder and destruction of the European Jews. He formed the word genocide by combining the word geno and uh, side, which is Greek from race or tribe and from the Latin word for killing. And so it quite fittingly has been used and originally kind of considered in terms of um, race and ethnicity. Um, however, we later on, we, we've started seeing genocides revolve around um, sexual orientation, gender identities and other factors. In proposing this brand new term, Lemkin had in mind a coordinated plan where the destruction of essential foundations of life of national groups and the annihilation of them would be key. And that's how kind of the original team, as it were, envisaged what genocide was based off what they'd seen in Nazi Germany. However, genocide is a little bit more complex than just this, and this comes in eight different stages. Um, and so Genocide Watch as an organization is an interesting one to have a little peek at their website. Um, they have, um, a, alongside key academics in this field, outlined eight different stages of genocide, which that if anyone's ever looked at theories of inequality, this kind of might look a little bit familiar. Um, however, it's got one key difference, which we'll come back to at the end. 
So the first stage of genocide is always a classification where the differences aren't respected. There's a division of us versus them. And this can be carried out through the use of stereotypes, low level gossip, um, uh, the excluding of people who are perceived to be different on a kind of on an everyday level, as it were. So it's the everyday racisms, everyday sexisms. And you need those foundations in place because the next stage of the genocide can't happen without it. The next stage becomes a symbolization where a visible manifestation of hatred takes place. So Jews, for example, in occupied Europe were forced to wear yellow stars to show that they were different. In Rwanda, in the genocide there, the identifying features were people's ID cards, where that showed you were Hutu or Tutsi, which was came from colonial Belgian thought, uh, which was a way in which to divide and conquer populations. Um, so th these key identifiers are important the pink triangle, for example, in this case. But this can also happen on other levels. Um, these visual manifestations can also be these stereotypes hardening to say what a group looks like or what a group is supposed to be. And this leads to stage three, the dehumanization stage, where those who are perceived as different are treated with an, no form of personal dignity. Um, this helps to ingratiate within a society that this group are indeed different and should be treated so. So during the, the Rwandan genocide, Tutsis were referred to as cockroaches. The Nazis referred to Jews as vermin. Um, and there were other similar terms for um, gay and bisexual men who are the focus of most of the talk today, uh, though we will touch upon lesbians and transgender communities. Um, in terms of the, the next stage of genocide, is it must be stated here that these are always planned. They're never random. Um, regimes of hatred undergo a training program where they have to visibly train people to carry out this destruction of a people. And so with the Rwandan genocide, for example, some people say that the shooting down of the prime minister's plane was the precursor to the genocide and that was planned. Um, you have to bear in mind in Nazi Germany, um, uh, the, there was a Hitler youth which ingratiated people's ideas long before they entered adulthood and they brought those ideals with them. The fifth stage is a polarization. Now, at this point, the media usually steps in and hate groups emerge. So the Nazis used their newspaper to spread and incite messages of hate around Jewish people and other groups. Um, and so propaganda begins to get used at this stage. Now we've started to um, pull these groups out as being symbolically visible. You then need to polarize them and polarize the public. And this stage involves a preparation. So victims become identified based on their differences. And in the Cambodian genocide, for example, the Khmer Rouge separated out those who lived in cities and those who lived in the country. If you lived in the cities, you were too bourgeois, they needed to, therefore needed to work. Um, and they separated those who they felt needed to work for them to death and those who didn't. Jews in Nazi Europe, as you may know, were forced to live in ghettos. Um, then becomes perhaps the most obvious end point of this is that once these stages are built up, this ends up in extermination. The hate group murders the identified victims in a systematic campaign of violence. And the World War II Holocaust was unique in the sense that it used technologies, didn't it? It was a conveyor belt using the Henry Ford model to eliminate people in a, an administratively functional and efficient way. And usually at this point, millions of lives have been destroyed or changed beyond recognition. So at that point, it could arguably said that's what genocide is. However, it's not because there's always another stage and it is denial. Uh, the final stage of genocide is usually that the perpetrators or later generations deny the existence of the crime in the first place. Uh, we've seen this happen in terms of Holocaust deniers. We also have seen this done in terms of how the state has done this, uh, which we'll come back to later when we start looking at the men in the pink triangle. So that final stage of denial is really important and a one to remember in this one. So let's take a look at life beforehand. Um, in 1933, it's estimated that there were about 130 gay bars in Berlin. The Tiergarten, and still is, I must add, is a well-known cruising uh, ground, which is basically the, the park in the centre of Berlin as a city. Um, this was a place for people to pick up soldiers predominantly at the time. 
Now, if you look to the photograph on the other side, you can see the El Dorado Bar. The El Dorado Bar was a, um, it's sadly now only closed down a couple of years ago, um, but it, these were bars in which hosted cabaret. People like Marlena Dietrich, before she fled Nazi Germany, were said to have frequented these places, along with the Metropole Bar, just a little bit further down the street. But it gives an idea of how busy and, and kind of enlightened and very liberal it was at this, at this stage. Um, the El Dorado Bar can also then be seen later when the Nazis had really risen to power. And you can see how these bars were then going to be closed down. But Berlin was a thriving hotspot at the time. It was the LGBT mecca, as it were, of, of Europe. And as leading thinkers at the time, like Magnus Hirschfeld, came out as academics, where um, from the a uh, brand new um, process of sexology, documenting people's sexual lives. And at uh, this point, his books and a lot of his artworks and everything he'd collected from around the world with his research team were burnt by fascist students um, in the famous night of the burning of the books. Hirschfeld, however, was a real reformer. Um, and he reportedly, uh, sorry, repeatedly tried to reform Germany's laws, particularly what was in place at that time, which was the notorious paragraph 175. Paragraph 175, simply put, which came about in 1871, uh, was focused on men. It was that a male who indulges um, within a criminally indecent activity, suitably vague, with another male, or allows himself to participate in these activities um, will be punished with jail. Um, in Berlin at the time, and I'm not a historian, I will, will preface this, I'm a sociologist in my job, but, um, and so I'm an amateur interested historian, you could say on this topic. Um, but at this time, what I do know is that Berlin, this was rarely enforced. And so because elites used these grounds, um, people who were popular and rich came to these bars and this was a thriving area. So at the time, you can see examples of the El Dorado bar of um, uh, trans and lesbian communities taking shape and of all men's dance nights. Um, and at the time, some kind of wonderful imagery of uh, the, the theater and the cabaret behind it, which for many people, when fleeing more conservative areas of Europe at that time, sought to find solace and community and friendship and even lovers. You see the kind of um, the rise of the kind of butch femme uh, style lesbian communities at that point in time, um, which emerged at the time. There's some brilliant older photographs which can be found for free online. I highly recommend you check them out because they're enlightening and it's it's a little window into into the past, which existed for a very short liminal space of time. Um, Magnus Hirschfeld, who can be seen in the centre of this park bench uh, with two trans, trans women, um, at the time was, like I say, a real advocate of this. And sadly, um, he never got to see his dreams come true of paragraph 175 um, being repealed. And we'll come to that soon. So in the 20s, we've established so far that gay inverted commas culture flourished in parts of Prussia, particularly Berlin, where it was known at the time as the homosexual capital of Europe. This led many people to come out the closet and feel relatively safe and lead relatively open lives. Um, the tolerance shown at the time in Prussia was used by more conservative speakers at the time to talk about how it was uh, depraved or un-German um, part of Weimar culture at that time. And you also have to remember that Germany was um, had gone through economic collapse after World War I, and due to the repayments it had to make back to the Allies, it was in serious debt. And so there was a culture of mass unemployment. Um, and this led the Nazis, obviously, to capitalise on that. And we very often see periods of economic decline and LGBT people or sexual and gender minorities being used as scapegoats. And this was very, uh, this was used by, uh, well, time memorial is still used to this day. Um, but in 1934, Ernest Rom, who ran the SA, um, which was the kind of paramilitary wing of the Nazi party, um, was executed by Hitler. Uh, Ernest Rom was a very open gay man. And in the Night of the Long Knives, um, he was murdered with his male lover in his bed, alongside many other SA members. 
And there is some evidence to state that Hitler himself was largely ambivalent about homosexuality, um, wasn't really that bothered either way until Ernest Rom become too much of a public figure and was becoming more popular and so had to be executed. Um, not helped by the virulent homophobia of Himmler, who will come too soon. So at this point, a climate of fear begins to take over as the Nazis came into political power. And many lesbians at this point use the opportunity to get married, either marriages of convenience and um, to avoid being sent to the concentration camps. Some, like I say, married other gay men. Um, others entered uh, into uh, marriages with sympathetic straight men. Um, it was an opportunity to hide within plain sight. Um, the Great War, however, or World War I, had given Germans an idea of manliness, which, fed, which, which was heightened by the Nazis, which um, at that time, gay men did not in their eyes fit. Gay men were largely seen, and I use the, the gay as one identifier here, they were seen as feminine, unfit to be soldiers, cowardly, unpatriotic, um, because they did not create children. And Germany needed children. It had lost a huge amount of its army and uh, people in World War I or the Great War. Um, and so there was this linkage here, which we see happening throughout the world today, where masculinity and citizenship and sexuality are pulled together. And um, those people who deserve and those people who do not deserve to become a citizen. The Prussian police launched a series of raids to shut down gay bars and paragraph 175 was enforced with renewed effect um, where the rounding up of gay men happened in the background. And at this point, um, I'm reliably informed by one professor that in the camps, so, some of the men with the pink triangle were known as 175ers um, due to the paragraph 175. Gay bars were briefly allowed to open in 1936, which was a strange move after they'd been shut down. And the reason why behind this was because of the Olympics. Um, Berlin was hosting the Olympics that year, and so foreign tourists were allowed to enter the uh, gay bars and queer and the gayborhoods and queer areas. Um, and this was a, a, a very clear marketing ploy at the time um, to not only uh, show a liberal side, as it were, for lack of a term, um, of Nazi Germany, but also to take names and to round up those people who'd escaped the first time round, who thought that this was a permanent move and that these bars were allowed to flourish. In 1937, the official newspaper of Nazi Germany estimated that there were two million homosexuals in Germany and called for their deaths. So you can start to see the stages of genocide that I outlined earlier taking shape, reaching the propaganda stage. And this was not helped by the leadership of Heinrich Himmler, who said at one point that 8% of men in Germany were gay. And he famously quoted, if that's how things remain, our nation will fall to pieces. Those who practice homosexuality deprive Germany of the children they owe her. Again, making that link between um, our desire and citizenship and who fits into a country and who does not. Gay men were seen to, seen to be carriers of a degeneracy that weakened society, it hindered population growth, it, it fit into the Aryan and eugenic policies at the time of those who were genetically superior versus those who were not. And lesbianism actually didn't enter the Nazi statute books. In fact, at the time, it was seen as children, kitchen and church uh, were felt to be controlling elements by society to keep wayward women in line. Um, and so it's believed at this point that uh, um, uh, out of all of the different groups who were put into the, the work in then death camps, 60% um, of gay men died. Uh, by far some of the highest figures of all groups who entered the camps. Um, we've seen 41% for political prisoners, 35% for Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it's quite clear, as you'll see afterwards, that the pink triangles were the lowest rung in the hierarchy. Um, originally, it was protested that a, an A would be the symbol, not the pink triangle, and it predated the pink triangle, and it stood for arsefucker, which was um, the term at the time. Um, and But then that was given the pink triangle to fit in with the, the method in which all groups were categorized. We do know that about 100,000 were arrested in total. Um, about 50,000 were officially sentenced. Some managed to buy their own way out and get out, uh, some managed to flee, some managed to bribe. Um, about 
from this number, about 15,000 people documented were sent to concentration camps. Um, and these were given the pink triangle. So at this time, when these people were rounded up, they were then um, measured and the details taken. You can see clearly from these photographs here that the pink triangle was a, a way in which uh, to identify people. Um, but these are some of the lives, some of the voices that are now forgotten in history um, of different people. And some of these will never be told. And there's a good reason for that, um, which I'll come back to with what happened to the Pink Triangles after the war. Um, there are some women who were never officially sentenced because of lesbianism. Um, but this lady here, I Ilse Todska, was a German musician. Um, she actually had Jewish people within her band. And it's said that she had a relationship with a Jewish woman, Ruth Bersinski, um, and she refused to stop seeing the woman. Um, for this reason, she was sent to Ravensbrück. Um, this did not fit in with a neat classification of pink triangle, so she was given a black triangle, which basically meant that you were an antisocial. And antisocials were people who were sex workers, um, drug addicts, alcoholics, um, who were largely put in, in the camps for that reason. Um, and then you've got the men with the pink triangle, as you've probably seen for the advert for this event, one of the, the most uh, famous images of a group of people collected together. There are others, but even though the names and the lives are documented, there isn't a great deal of photographs um, for this group, um, which is interesting in itself. Several years ago, I went to Sachsenhausen, which is a camp outside of Berlin. It was the headquarters for all the death camps, and it was, wasn't as big as some of the others. Um, but um, at the time they had an event on and Walter Richter stuck out to me at the time and I couldn't explain why as I was moving around the camp. Um, what I found interesting about Walter and I, I'm sad to say that we don't have Walter's real name and probably never will because it's not documented anywhere that we know of. Uh, but Walter Richter liked to make dresses out of crepe paper um, and met with other other people to wear dresses and that's the little we know that he had his little society or she I should say had his little society um, which who met and came into Sachsenhausen sadly at a time when there was a policy of work the pink triangles to death um, and so there was a directive which came from above that 200 people had to die and be worked to death who wore pink triangle and sadly um, this person was one of them and lasted no longer than six months in the camp. But that image really stuck out for me because it was a very hopeful image of a future at one point within Berlin where it looked more promising for people. Um, it looked more liberal. Then the extermination begins. The Third Reich at this point forced Jewish women and lesbians to perform sex acts um, with pink triangles. Um, Heinrich Himmler ordered that they be forced to perform this at least once a week. And so these female... Um, Jewish women and lesbian women who the rare cases are documented lesbian women um, who were brought in for on other triangle charges as it were um, were used as sex slaves. Um, this was psychologically damaging to both parties obviously and gay men were ordered to perform these acts as a form of conversion therapy. Um, those who were seen as worthy or those who could do it or perhaps were bisexual in some cases were able to do it and be released in some cases. Um, some gay men at this point had their testicles boiled off with hot water. Um, one of the survivors, Pierre Seale, said that the Nazis took 25 centimetres of wood up his own uh, rectum. Um, and so we see kind of a brutal barbarity and an experimentation with people as well in terms of uh, how we could castrate gay men, uh, gay and bisexual men. Additionally, um, a forced labour camps and within them, they were given more gruelling and dangerous work assignments, which is what happened to Walter Richter. Um, and this was a policy of extermination through work. Um, SS soldiers were known to use gay men uh, for target practice, aiming their weapons at the pink triangles that their human targets were forced to wear. Um, and as one anonymous writer says, a homosexual was never permitted to have a position of responsibility in the camp. 
which meant they could not be capos. Um, the capos were the people that looked after the barracks and they were other inmates. Usually they were people who were crim ex-criminals um, and they couldn't speak with other prisoners because there was this idea of contamination as a narrative um, where they would be seen to try and seduce them. If they did approach within five metres of a block, anyone caught uh, doing so would be publicly whipped. They were to remain, as this anonymous writer says, the damnedest of the damned, the camp shitty queers condemned to liquidation. Examples of brutality, and like I said, give the warning at the beginning. Um, some people have said that Jews and some of the authors who we have got some of the few surviving accounts, um, that Jews, homosexuals and gypsies, the yellow, pink, brown triangles were the prisoners who suffered the most frequently. Um, they got most of the torture or blows from the SS and the capos. They were seen as the lowest scum. Um, prisoners had to sleep in night shirts and they had to hold their hands outside the covers if you are pink triangle. This was unique to them. Um, this was supposed to prevent masturbation. And one prisoner recalled that anyone caught without underwear or with their hands under the covers um, were then taken outside, had buckets of water poured over them, and they had to stand there for a good hour or in some cases more. Very few survived this. Um, there was a cent centimeters of ice on window panes below freezing temperatures and bronchitis was prevalent as a result. And it was rarely are rare, as they say, for a homosexual to come back alive from the hospital. Another tragic story comes from Pierre Sell um, and, and says after his arrest, he was sent to a concentration camp in Shermek. There he said that during a morning roll call, which everyone was obliged to do, a Nazi commander announced a public execution. A man was brought out and he recognised his face. It was the face of his 18-year-old lover from Mulhouse. He says that the guards stripped the clothes off his lover, placed a metal bucket over his head, and then released their trained German shepherd dogs on him, which mauled him to death, right in front of everybody. Now, one of the reasons I'm talking about these stories and examples of brutality isn't to be um, confrontational. It's to really talk about what's going on here, um, because a lot of the what happened to other groups within these camps are documented, and these stories are told, but so few stories of the pink triangles are told, and they need to be. Other examples of brutality was the Project Pink um, so one uh, person stated that in his camp, the homosexuals were grouped into liquidation commandos. They were placed under a triple camp discipline. This meant they got less food than other inmates, more work and stricter supervision. Now, the food in the camps was specifically measured to give enough calories to be able to work but not fight. And so, which was usually weak coffees and a um, hardened bread and soup. Um, they got less than this. So it was a, an actual example of working people to death. Again, hitting the crime of genocide. Um, they put one man outside under a cold shower, as one person remarks. It was frosty, bitly cold evening, and he stood outside through the night. He then was tied to a post and placed under a lamp until he began to sweat. Then at the point when he started to sweat, he was then put under a cold shower again. So hot and cold water torture. And by morning, his breathing had become an audible rattle and he died. Um, a young effeminate man, who was stayed by another prisoner, was forced to dance in front of the SS men, who then chained him by his hands and feet to a rack and lifted him to a cross beam in the guard's barracks where he was beaten. There are reports of some relationships which um, formed in the camps um, of people who clung on to each other and met each other, knowing that they wouldn't have very long to go. Um, a, a quite a horrific account is when six youths were arrested for stealing coal. Uh, they were got sent to a concentration camp. Um, however, there was an administrative error and the young people ended up sharing and got put in the barracks with the pink triangles. What's interesting about this and horrifying about this is that the SS was so shocked that they actually removed the thieves from the space and executed them to save their morality and their innocence. Death was seen as better than sharing the barracks with the pink triangles. So at this point, other actors get involved. And so whilst this brutality is happening, other actors are, are wanting to, to become part of the medicalization process. And one of these was the Danish doctor, Carl Werner, who joined the SS for the sole purpose of pursuing his research into curing gay men. Um, and this was an, a, a conscious attempt by the state 
um, to push for an agenda of um, medicalization and sterilization. And in Buchenwald, doctors conducted hormonal experiments on 12 gay men that we have the documentation for. They made incisions in their groin. They implanted a metal tube, which released testosterone over a prolonged period. Because they believed the lack of testosterone falsely was the cause of homosexuality. Now, again, this makes that link back to masculinity and statehood, doesn't it? The fact that they were seen as lesser than and had to be made into more than in order to be able to fit into the state. Because if they showed signs of improvement, they were allowed to be released. Some of the men claimed to have become heterosexual, naturally as a self-protection me measure. The results, however, are hugely unreliable, scientifically disproven, um, and a lot stated simply that they were cured to be released from the camp. But obviously this needed proof. Um, those who did not show any form of improvement and were given sex, essentially sex slaves, were then um, determined to be chronic or incurable homosexuals if they could not have sex with them. Despite this man being arrested in 1945, Werner somehow managed to convince the authorities that his research was important to the scientific community. And he died a free man in Argentina in 1965. He got away with it. And what's terrifying about this really is that uh, the allies also agreed with this. Um, to let, allow them to go, you're essentially saying, aren't you, that this is okay to do. Um, and at the time, we also have to remember that in most nation states in Europe and the, in parts of the rest of the world, homosexuality was criminalized. And so it was seen as, as something wrong in people. And there was a eugenics movement that wasn't just owned by the Nazis. This was sweeping through Europe um, at the time anyway. Um, now, I've touched a little bit upon um, lesbian women, and I've touched mainly on, on gay and bisexual men here, really. Um, but there's also some interesting accounts of trans people, but they're very few and far between in the documentation. We do know that in 1933, the Hamburg City Administration asked their head of police at the time to pay special attention to a then term used transvestites and to deli deliver them to concentration camps. Um, the Institute of Forensic Medicine as a state actor backed this up and they said that the phenomenon of transvestism be eliminated from public life. And you can see this ramping up, although again, very few cases were documented. For the most part, the Nazis made little distinction between transgender and cisgender men and women. They made very little distinction between them. In fact, trans women who we do know who were sent to concentration camps wore the inverted pink triangle along with cis men. Uh, transgender men wore the black triangle or the antisocial triangle with uh, cisgender women. The few trans men and uh, lesbian women who were sent to the camps on the basis of their identity are few and far between. But if they were, they were often placed in the camp brothels. Um, Charlotte von Malsdorf kept their memories alive, and she's a particularly controversial figure when you read into her life, and I highly recommend you do. Um, she ran the Grundeset Museum, and I apology if my pronunciation isn't right for this one. This was in East Germany at the time, and it became, at a time when it was criminalised, an LGBT meeting point for people. Um, and she fought to keep a museum open. Now, the state was very aware that this was a meeting point. Um, and so she had to work with the secret police to save a museum in order to keep that going. Um, so we've got all these accounts and these stories. So then what happened afterwards? So paragraph 175 remained in force in East Germany until 1967, where Charlotte was running a meeting point, and West Germany until 1969. A great book about this, if you get a chance to read it, is The Men with the Pink Triangle by Heinz Heiger. Um, it's one of the few accounts um, that really document the, the life histories of the men with the pink triangle. And because this act remained in force, many of the Holocaust survivors who were gay men could be re-imprisoned and were re-imprisoned for repeat offences. And they were kept on lists for, of sex offenders. What's the most heartbreaking thing of all of this is that under the Allied military government of Germany, some gay men had to fought, serve out the rest despite being in concentration camps, despite being the lowest rung of the hierarchy and going through what they went through. They had to serve their times out of imprisonment, regardless of how long they'd spent in the concentration camp. 
Compensation was turned down to gay men as recently as 1982. And it wasn't until 2002 that the German government apologized to the gay community for what had happened. And in 2005, the European Parliament at this point adopted a resolution on the Holocaust, which included the persecution of gay men. Um, too little too late for many people. Um, in that time period, many people passed away. Um, I'm not sure if people recently watched It's a Sin, if you're watching from the UK here, but it was that concept of dying with shame, which happened to many people. They never got a chance to tell their story. They never got the jobs they wanted because they, were, they had to prison on their, in their background. Um, and so this excluded people from society for the rest of their lives in many cases. And this is why we have so few surviving accounts, because those voices were silenced. Those voices were edited and covered up. Now, this is the case, really, when we're talking about the final stage of genocide is denial. This is a denial from a statehood who says, well, nothing happened. They weren't in there. Um, they, you know, they're, they're not a problem or they don't belong to us. And this was an act of denial of, of the lives of these men and women who had gone through this. So things to think about in this one. Um, there was an article way back in 2001 where Martin Gilbert's book Never Again came out and it was supposed to be the most comprehensive account of the Holocaust. Yet the fate of non-Jews within this book got um, merits two page chapter. And as with school books, um, which I often found um, when I used to teach in schools, particularly very often the mass murder of homosexuals and commas gets one single sentence. And their lives are largely forgotten about and they're not mentioned. So if, if we're talking that these are great comprehensive accounts, then why are other voices never being told? There was no Oscar Schindler for gay men. No one seemed to really have considered hiding gay men from the clutches of the SS and the Gestapo. Um, there was no person to the rescue on this one. And the last known gay man who passed away in 2011 was this fella here, uh, Rudolf Brasda. Uh, passed away at the age of 98. I spent three years in Book involved, and um, like I say, he's one of the last fighters for social justice. And as you can see, he's wearing his pink triangle uh, still on his jacket. Um, he was determined to make sure that the lives were heard and to get compensation. There were three, and I find this a really interesting quote, there were three commandments which emerged from the shadow of the Holocaust. Thou shall not be a perpetrator, thou shall not be a victim, and thou shall not be a bystander. And the question is, are we, have we been, do we continue to be? Because we've made some wonderful attempts to repair some of the damage of what's happened. The state uh, of Germany granted uh, the Pink Triangle um, in Berlin, which is in the local neighborhood in the uh, center of the city. I took this photograph myself and it's a wonderful memorial left behind. There are other parts of the world like Amsterdam, which also have their own version of the Pink Triangle. And I've also seen a one in a park in the middle of Barcelona as well. And I'm sure there are many more across the world. To my knowledge, I don't think we've got one in the UK, but I'm willing to be proved wrong on that one. So the question we keep asking in amongst all of this, isn't it, is never again. This a Holocaust should never happen again. And my thing is, well, is it? Is this the case? Because we're seeing this happening right under our noses and it's happening now. And this is why report out do the work that we do. Um, in Chechnya right now and at this moment in time, increasingly, um, we've seen it become f uh, more conservative, adopt a, a, a harsh version of Sharia law. And we've seen the president and his son, Ramzan, who was the person in the photograph, become the head of the Chechen Republic. Ramzan is unapologetically homophobic. And since March 2017, we've seen a violent crackdown on the uh, LGBTQI plus community, the abduction and detention of gay and bisexual men who have been beaten and who have been tortured. At least three and reportedly as many as 20 have been killed so far at, at this point in 2017. A precise number will never know. Um, an activist for the Russian LGBT network said that people have been released from prisons uh, June 
and knowing that their family will uh, kill them to uh, give a sense of honour, to cleanse the stain on their family's honour for this. And Ramzan himself has has pushed this. He said he would like everybody removed from Chechnya who's um, a sexual gender minority by Ramadan. And it never, never obviously never happened, but people have fled. Um, he's even argued that there's no gay people in Chechnya, which is fascinating. <laughs> and he said, take them to Canada, to other liberal places in his mind, to, to cleanse or to cleanse the blood in amongst people. And we don't know how many people have been perhaps murdered or harmed or tortured by their own families. This is but a tip of an iceberg. And for those who were here earlier when I went through the stages of genocide, you can quite clearly see something happening here. So this image that you see on the photograph is one of the camps. Um, reports in 2017, which were verified by a Russian LGBT network, uh, were shown gay men held at a secret, secret prison in Argon. Um, it described many sources um, in a concentration camp where this was subjected to violence and forms of torture. Uh, Chechen men were being detained in multiple detention centers and were tortured with electronic shocks. On January the 11th, 2019, just before coronavirus had really, or just after, sorry, that was a little later, reported that another gay purge had begun in the country um, in December 2018 with several gay men, and this time now women, being detained. So the state has uh, expanded its reach. The Russian LGBT network believe that around 40 people were detained and two killed, but we'll never truly know the extent of this number. This bears striking similarities to the Holocaust of World War II and the men with the pink triangle. Um, the rounding up in camps, the detentions, the dehumanization, the beatings and the humiliation um, of men and women and uh, presumably trans people. I don't have any knowledge of this at the moment, um, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if this is happening, um, where they are bringing them in and they're harming them. And it follows exactly the same route as what we've seen before. So please, at this point, if you have a voice, raise it, because this needs to stop. We're seeing a Holocaust happen under our very noses. And this is a deliberate, targeted group of people who have been picked for this, and we need to do something about it. Um, I'm not an advert for this, but I highly recommend you do have a look. If you are in the UK, you can watch us for free. Um, and so it's called Welcome to Chechnya. Um, it's a documentary um, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, um, which is looking inside Chechnya and what is happening in this element and why the Russian Republic is doing nothing about it, because Chechnya is semi-autonomous and Putin himself is allowing this to happen. Um, just as a side note on this one. The UN have come down hard on this. There has been an international movement of people who are trying to make sure that this stops and that this does not continue. And whilst coronavirus may or may not have made life better or worse for people in Chechnya at the moment, um, it's still happening. There is a still a state a motive for this to continue. So the point of today's talk was to pull that parallel together. The parallel of the lived experience of the men, the pink triangle, way back in World War II and also the lives of people who are happening right now. And the question is, if we keep saying never again, then we really need to mean never again. Thank you for listening.